Hi guys, welcome back to The Pressing Matters. I'm Scott Wilson. And today I wanted to do something a little different. I um, had noticed in the new release bulletins that uh, 40th anniversary of Quincy Jones, The Dude was coming out. And I know it's a little different from what I usually cover, but I thought, you know, this was a really big album, a really good sounding album when it came out. And I thought, well, let me try it and see what the major labels can do with a title like this. Um, it's the 40th anniversary of The Dude, and they produce a very, very nice um, reissue. It's uh, done in a gatefold sleeve this time. A beautiful picture of Quincy, and all the lyrics and credits are on the gatefold. And uh, it's done on black vinyl. Um, there's no mastering engineer or pressing plant or anything, any of that that all we audiophiles love to find out about. But it's produced by Universal Music and they tend to produce really good um, standard reissues. So I was very, very curious to hear what they've done with this record. I did own this record at one time. Um, it was sort of off of the beaten path for me. I wasn't really into pop music as such, but uh, at that time I was more into rock music, so this was a little bit, you know, fluff for me. But um, I did appreciate its sonic qualities, and um, I remember it being quite well produced. And uh, also at the time, um, well, a couple years after it first came out, it came out in an audiophile edition. Um, I don't know if you guys remember that, but um, or if you were even born then. <laughs> I know we have some younger uh, viewers, but this was uh, 1981. Uh, so I think the audiophile edition probably came out in 83 or 4. Um, it was... Uh, it was a half-speed mastered edition. I think it was done by Nautilus Super Discs, but I could be mistaken. It might have been um, CBS Master Sound. Both of those companies were producing um, audiophile editions, um, kind of riding on the success of Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab and their half-speed mastered uh, series. Uh, I was not a fan of either one of those um, series. They didn't seem to get it right where mobile, Fidel mobile Fidelity at least got it right most of the time. And uh, I think I even might have had that special edition um, at one time. I was working in a, a record store back in 81, and um, I remember playing this quite a bit when it came out on the system on the, uh, in the store. And it did sound really, really impressive. Um, and it was a runaway hit. Um, Quincy Jones, uh, as you know, um, is very famous for his collaboration with uh, Michael Jackson and Thriller, and also uh, Off the Wall before that. So if you know those albums, you have an idea of his style of producing and arranging. It's very lush, very perfectionist. Um, beautifully done and you know Quincy had been an arranger big band arranger and jazz musician big band jazz musician uh, way prior to those albums being released um, I remember seeing some of his albums from the early 60s and he was a noted figure then so this kind of brought all of his talents to a solo album and here he's helped out by a number of great uh, talents. Um, primarily on this album, what was notable was the appearance of James, James Ingram, um, who had two of the hits on this album. Uh, the very sentimental Just Once, and also very sentimental <laughs> 100 Ways. Find 100 Ways. and. Uh, those um, 
were the big hits from the album, but there were also um, the lead-off track, I Know Corita, was also a big hit um, for Quincy, uh, and that features another singer, Chaz Jankel, who had a hit around that time, Glad to Know You, and uh, also featured on the album is the magnificent Patty Austin, who has a couple of lead vocal tracks. Uh, one that was a minor disco hit, Betcha Wouldn't Hurt Me. And um, she also sings um, on Razzmatazz. And um, I think one other, one of the other tracks towards the end of the album. But the, the first side is killer, all killer, no filler. So it starts out with I, I Know Corita, which is a very up-tempo number just fun to blast on a hi-fi stereo system. It has impact, it has just uh, incredible depth and sound stage. Of course, it's all artificial, but um, it's a lot of fun to listen to. And one of the really amazing things about the, uh, the first track is the backing vocals. Towards the end of the, um, well, towards the middle of the track, you hear Patty Austin start to come in with backing vocals. And the way it's arranged is just incredible. It's so uh, magical, the way he did this. And uh, she sounds just incredible, incredible. It really, it makes that track uh, jump um, up in stature. It, it, really, it really makes a big difference the way he's done, actually, the backing vocals throughout the whole album. Um, that, that track uh, leads into a more um, soulful groove with the title track, The Dude, and it's kind of an early proto-rap song. It has a rap in the middle of it, and uh, it's a lot of fun um, uh, track as well. And then um, we come to one of the big hits, Just Once, um, which I've probably heard just one too many times. Um, it was overplayed on uh, adult contemporary pop uh, radio. Um, beautifully crafted pop music and a really a big win for James Ingram. But um, not one I need to hear too much, but I did appreciate the lush production and it was it was quite nice. Uh, the real the real um, surprise track on this is the last track on side one. Bet you wouldn't hurt me. And I wish it went on on and on because it's too short. But uh, Patty Austin sings a lead on that, and it was a. I remember hearing it in dance clubs around that time. It wasn't a big hit at all, but wow, it's a great, a great track, and I would love to get a hold of a extended version if there is one. I think there might be, um, or maybe the DJs of the time extended it somehow from the album track. But it was, uh, it's a great way to end the first side. Um, so yeah, you get quite a selection of stuff here. It's kind of a Latin start with a brassy big band sound on I Know Corita. Uh, you get a rap, kind of soulful groove with a dude. Just Once is a sentimental ballad and Bet You Wouldn't Hurt Me is disco um, flavored song. Um, the other side has other strong tracks. Um, another lead vocal from Patty Austin and another one from uh, James Ingram, uh, which is 100 Ways, uh, that was the Grammy Award winning song from the album. And uh, a couple of other tracks that are equally, equally uh, strong. I mean, it's strong all the way through. It's lush, it's beautifully produced, audiophile, ear candy. So, um, how do they do with the rest of the album. I mean, as far as plating and presentation and pressing. Um, I was surprised. I was surprised for a major label release that costs $20 uh, 
um, on Amazon. I was very pleased with the pressing. It was amazingly silent throughout most of the record. I mean, all of the record, really. I mean, there was nothing. And I was like, wow, this is better than some of the audiophile labels are putting out. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but um, there are some um, minor problems. Uh, I am very sensitive to pitch and if there is a little bit of an off-center pressing, I notice it. Um, on this one, one side is pressed a little bit off-center. It's not noticeable at all on the outer bands, um, but towards the inner band, I started to notice it on my first listen. Um, on subsequent listens, I kind of um, made peace with it. I know it's never perfect and um, I enjoyed the music as it was and I didn't really let that affect me too much but um, you might want to try for perfect pressing. I may ask for a second copy just to see if I can get one that's perfectly centered. Um, of course this is this is not just the major labels having problems with this it's everybody everybody including QRP and RTI, they all have issues with centering a record. I don't, I don't know what it is these days, but somewhere or somehow the art of pressing the record on center or punching the hole on center has become um, a little bit elusive. Um, so, you know, if you get one that's not quite to your liking, not quite perfect, if you are sensitive to pitch variation, you may want to try for a second pressing. But um, I think I'm going to go with, um, I would say a 7 out of 10 for this, for, for as far as sound and presentation. Um, only dropping it to 7 because of that uh, pressing problem. Um, the audio, on the other hand, is, is excellent. You know, of course, it's digital. Um, it's from a digital file. It was recorded analog, um, I believe, co completely analog, because it was from 1981. And if they had used an analog master or noting, noted uh, engineer, it would be shouted from the rooftops. There is no such thing even noted on here. Um, so we don't know who, who mastered it and how it was done. <coughs> but. Um, you can bet that it's digital and uh, it's done well. It's digital done well. I mean, I like analog mastering if the analog tape exists, but I don't turn my nose up at a digital mastering that's done well. And this one is done well. I, it, it, can be, it can be cranked. It doesn't have um, that kind of a digital distortion that plagued earlier uh, digital remasterings. It, it's smooth, <coughs> it's smooth, it's analog-like, and um, very pleasant to listen to. So overall, music, 10 out of 10, it's, it's great, and uh, definitely worth picking up if you're interested in this kind of music. Um, I would say, you know, if you can get a great pressing, you're on the right track. Um, and it's, I don't think it's difficult. As a matter of fact, if I played this for anyone else in my household, they probably wouldn't even notice the pitch variation. Um, I do notice that, but um, it's minor. My second listen, as I said, um, second time around, it went right by me and I just got into the music. So I think you will too. Thank you for um, tuning into this special edition um, of The Pressing Matters. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and liking the videos. And I'll see you next time.